Hello and welcome to this episode of the Ideas Factory. This week has been very interesting. We've seen the 75th UNGA session was held and for the first time, the world leaders were talking virtually and putting forth their ideas at the world's biggest diplomatic forum. We saw Prime Minister Modi, President Donald Trump, Xi Jinping, uh, all the world leaders putting forth their ideas, uh, especially at a time when the world is going through this pandemic and a severe pandemic, something like uh, the world has never seen before, which brought the entire world to a halt, literally. So uh, by their speeches, in a way, we get an idea of the geostrategic uh, uh, changes that the world is witnessing. So on this episode of the Ideas Factory with me is Professor Harsh Pant to talk about and look closely at these speeches. And we would like to begin with our Prime Minister's speech, Harsh. Uh, two very important points there that have been analyzed and discussed, and I would like you to analyze it. What do you think about it? First of all, the way Prime Minister Modi talked about the fundamental reforms being the need of the hour at the United Nations and how India could no longer, or, or he raised a question, how long can India be out of the decision making at the UN? And at the same time, without really naming China very clearly, he took a swipe at China saying how China has engaged in, um, the, you know, with countries around it has engaged in a debt trap diplomacy. Uh, uh, at the same time, he put forth India's vision. He did not name China. He did not name Pakistan. How do you really analyze his speech and, and look at his speech? Uh, because a lot of people thought it was a very dignified speech and uh, the prime minister put forth India's interests in a very uh, dignified manner. So how do you look at this speech? I think it was a well-crafted speech. And in particular, I think there has been a change in India's tone and tenor now when it speaks about UN reforms. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we have been, India has been talking about UN reforms now for decades. Uh, India was one of the first countries to talk about how important it is going to be to have institutional changes uh, in responding to the larger geopolitical changes. But I think what uh, Prime Minister Modi has done is to give it a certain twist. And the idea is that, you know, look, of course, India should be there at the UN Security Council as a permanent member. That's an important reform that, that UN should deliver, that bringing in different voices like India, making, it, uh, making UN a more democratic organization. But I think he is, what, what he outlined was something, uh, something much more uh, interesting, wherein the idea is that, look, India has been doing with uh, and uh, has been part of the larger multilateral framework for decades. India has contributed enormously to the UN. Uh, so you don't need a recognition as such from the UN as, you know, as, as a uh, tamga from the UN that you have done very well. What is important is the future of multilateralism. It is a future of multilateralism that is at stake. India may or may not be there. But what is going to happen to the UN? And he raised this question at a time when UN is celebrating its 75th anniversary. There is a real crisis of confidence, as he put it, in, in the UN. And very pointedly, he asked, where was the UN when COVID-19 struck? When, where, where was the UN when you had a pandemic, global pandemic, uh, you know, really changing uh, the trajectory of global politics and, 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 uh, and how societies, economies were responding to it? And I think that's a very clever way of saying that, look, India may or may not be uh, really given a position at the UN Security Council. But by not doing that, what UN Security Council is doing is, uh, is uh, you know, decline, in a sense, uh, not living up to the expectations of its founding fathers, not in a sense responding to the challenge of the global order, mm -hmm. and therefore decreasing the confidence in the global multilateral order. And this will have grave repercussions. You know, you have you will have fragmented multilateralism as a result of this. Yeah. And uh, I think that is where India wants to pivot in. And, and the, the other point that you made about how he juxtaposed this with India's performance, with the performance of certain other countries, again, without naming. You know, uh, we talk of UN Security Council permanent members as if they are sui generis leaders. They are not. Look at what they were doing when the crisis struck, uh, COVID-19 struck in the early months. China was busy internally, the US was busy internally, the EU was facing a crisis of confidence. It was countries like India that were actually talking of global leadership that were actually pivoting around the larger multilateral framework. India talked of SARC, India talked of G20, India pushed these platforms into making certain critical decisions. So clearly I think the focus is on 
uh, how India has shaped uh, or how India's leadership credentials have emerged over the last few years and how global multi multilateralism is facing a crisis unlike any it has faced in recent memory. And therefore, it is very important not only for India to be there, for, for a larger structural reform to be initiated, because unless that does not happen, we are looking at very difficult times for global multilateral order. And as you said, during this pandemic, during this time, increasingly the big organizations, the world organizations, as well as the world leaders have been found wanting. You know, US itself did not provide the leadership that was expected of it. So very, very correctly, uh, the PM pointed out that how the reforms are the need of the hour. At the same time, when you spoke of the vaccine, we've seen that the pandemic, COVID-19, uh, there has been a lot of politicization and pointing fingers at each other. And President Trump has time and again uh, called it the Wuhan virus. We've seen that Indian diplomats and in India has refrained from calling it the Wuhan virus or the Chinese virus, and we've stuck to COVID-19. So we see a different behavior from Trump, but uh, when you look at Pre uh, Prime Minister Modi's speech at the UN, he spoke of the pandemic and he, he talked of a very constructive role that India can play. He spoke of the vaccine and said that India is uh, giving an assurance to the world community that India's vaccine production and delivery capacity will be used for all humanity. So there, there is a difference when you look at his speech and you and you look at the way President Trump has been talking about it, or which we will come to President Trump and Xi Jinping's speeches later. But uh, there was a very fine, uh, you know, uh, element in this part too when he spoke of the vaccine and being there for the entire humanity. Yes, I think you know it. It, it was a speech that was almost elevating in in, in a sense, and the discourse which has really been about you know very narrow. Uh, issues. Uh, you know, if you look at other speeches, they are quite narrow in their orientation, especially major powers. Yeah. So therefore, to, to have India and to have Mr. Modi speak there as a genuine statesman-like speech that, look, if India, uh, you know, India is not part of the big uh, apparatus, the UN Security Council, but India's approach is very multilateral in its essence that we, you know, even if we have the capacity to first prioritize our vaccine development, we are not saying it in so many words. We are not doing it. We are trying to make a case that India can only benefit from that, from those vaccines, from those pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. from that pharmaceutical capacity, if it is anchored in a larger global framework, if everyone else also benefits from it. So therefore, there is a sense of globalism and humanism uh, that I think India's traditional values uh, give to India to stand up as a leader in, in, the, in global platforms that I think Mr. Modi was able to harness to make his case uh, for India's leadership. And I think that when you compare it to other countries, their speeches, their orientations, their policies, it comes out as a stark contrast. You know, we are talking of vaccine nationalism today. We are talking of how countries, even some very, you know, countries that you don't consider, um, uh, you know, very problematic in, 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 in those sense, talking of stocking up stockpiles. Uh, so so there, are, there are questions about how nations are becoming more and more inward looking. And I think, therefore, for, for India to point out the challenges of multilateralism, that if something is not done today, then this is really a downward slope where, uh, yeah. where the multilateral order will actually end up becoming fragmented, disoriented, almost on the verge of collapse. And so, and, and what COVID-19 and issues around COVID-19 epitomize today is a larger breakdown in that consensus. And Mr. Modi was trying to act actually raise that debate to a level where we can come back to the fundamentals, come back to the first principles of multilateralism and make a case to the, you know, to the world that it is not simply about India saying that, look, we need a seat at the Security Council. Of course, we need that and it, we deserve that. But there's a larger issue at stake and, that is, and we should not deviate from those perspectives. So I think when you compare his speech to others, when you look at his ideas of how India can play the role of a pharmaceutical uh, as, as a head, as the most important pharmaceutical anchor in the world, when you look at how he was talking about cooperation with countries, not simply in the neighborhood, but even beyond India's immediate neighborhood, I think he was he was telling a story that needs to be told. That India has done relatively well, given its constraints, given its capacity problems. India has been more active. India has been more engaged. India has been more multilateral in, in some ways than many other countries who actually yes. claim to be the origin, either the originators of multilateralism or who sit at the high table and decide on the future of multilateralism. 
pandemic has in any case already exposed the fault lines in the world order. And in contrast, when you look at uh, Trump's speech, who spent much of his UNGA speech attacking China, who he blamed for unleashing this plague on the world. Uh, so it was, uh, what difference did you find uh, in Trump's speech, speaking at this forum, which is the biggest diplomatic forum, and from an election speech to his domestic audience that he would make, it's almost, uh, how, how do you rate his speech? He just, he kept attacking China the way he's been doing it, rather than providing any kind of leadership. Or, I, yeah, I, I don't think he, you know, I think his disdain for, for uh, multilateral platforms is quite clear evident. from the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, he has withdrawn from so many of these UN uh, platforms, UN related uh, institutions, that I think we should not be any, in any doubt about where his, his priorities lie. And of course, he has a very tough election going forward. So it's not, it's not a surprise that his main audience were people back home, not, not the global audience. So he was not trying to impress anyone with his uh, with, with this uh, leadership credentials or great statesman-like approach to this, uh, to the question of multilateralism, he, you know, his whole idea has been uh, to divert attention from the problems that he faces internally. That his mismanagement is something that he wants to uh, pivot from and away to China question. How China is responsible for this? How China is, uh, you know, has to be uh, made accountable for this? Uh, there, there are some pertinent issues there, I think, when it comes to China. But I think coming from America, certainly, there are always expectations that America would you know, rise above this rancor, that America can lead the world in ways that you know, there is a history there uh, that it had done in the past. But uh, Mr. Trump certainly does not believe that that's the role that America should be playing. He has a very different ideas about America's role in the world. America first means for him uh, that priority should be given to American interests. Uh, and I think that is something that he articulated there as well, uh, that he, you know, his sense that all countries should look at their own interests first, uh, and that's, that's going to be good for multilateral order. So I think that is something that he also conveyed in his speech. Targeting China was for his domestic audience. Uh, I, you know, and, and I think every platform that he's been given in recent times, he has, he has tried to push that case. Now, certainly that, that means that America cedes that leadership role to another actor, to China, which despite all the problems, therefore can come in and say, look, we want multilateralism. So this is quite, a, you know, quite significant. And which was very, very uh, clear, which was very, very clear because she, as usual, came across as a defender of free trade and multilateralism, uh, even though his, his private, his international and his domestic persona are very, very different. That's a different story. But he appears uh, as a defender of multilateralism. Yes, because partly, uh, you know, Mr. Trump has given him uh, so much space to play the role of a statesman that despite all the troubles he is, he's creating around the world, he can still come and give almost a farcical speech that we believe in a peaceful global order, we believe in multilateral institutions, and we are there to lead them and we are there to create these norms, where every single action of China in recent months in, in last one year has been about dismantling that order, dismantling those institutional and normative frameworks. So I think the fact that America cannot play that, you know, cannot rise to the occasion means that Xi, Xi Jinping would use that platform to make a case about Chinese leadership. And some, some countries might get swayed by it. You know, some countries that are not getting directly affected by what Mr. Uh, by what uh, Xi and his party are, or Communist Party of China are doing around the world. But clearly, I think, uh, you know, that facade is also, uh, is also clearly going away. Uh, and making way for a, for a more realistic appraisal of China in most world capitals today. So while he can push for it, he can, he can uh, claim that he's all for global multilateral economic order, or global multilateral security order, but everything that, uh, that I think a lot of the countries know today about China and, and its behavior is that uh, this is not a country that can be trusted. And I think that's a question that continues to hang over Beijing and the Communist Party of China. So no amount of uh, delivery of uh, you know, grandiose speeches at the UN would matter. But I think what is striking is that uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Americans giving that space to, to, to China almost on a platter, uh, that you know, if, when America says, I'm not bothered about multilateral order, then even if Xi Jinping plays uh, you know, uh, lip service to this idea, there are many who would buy that. Many would see that this is something that perhaps is important for the world, smaller countries, countries that don't have the capabilities, countries that want some leadership, they would look to China. So I think that's where the trouble lies. And that's where I think, again, coming back to Mr. Modi's speech was interesting because it is, it, it was impo it is important for countries like India to make 
a case for an alternative that you know you can have america on the one hand and china on the other but there are other countries in the middle that believe in a in a multilateral order which is rules based a multilateral order that is transparent and a multilateral order that that you know generate some equity uh, to the best possible extent and i think that's the case that mr modi made and that's why you see this contrast when you put him you know uh, with with the trump speech and the the xi jinping speech that his speech comes off as perhaps uh, one that uh, rises to the occasion the challenges that we are facing at the moment much more mature and more statesman like rather than a uh, donald trump speech which was basically for the domestic audience and in any case under trump america has been more and more isolationist but when trump demands that the global organization hold accountable the nation which unleashed this plague on the world uh, it was a very strongly worded speech and uh, then we heard press uh, xi jinping as well you know their speeches at this forum have exposed the gap or the divide between china and america now such standoff was in public display at the un between china and and, and the us it makes the un more or less irrelevant it just shows that an organization where uh, some mediation would have happened or it provided a framework for engagement and mediation it's completely irrelevant and that's alarming isn't that very alarming and i think uh, you know in the sense the biggest question that uh, that uh, a lot of world leaders have today is what is the future of the global order uh, at a time when us and china seem to be on very different paths uh, and the idea the talk of this new cold war is actually very dangerous because you end up in a situation where you uh, you know almost replicate the the cold war model because at, remember at that time also un was hardly functioning uh you know one side would be to the 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 positions of the other side and the other side would would pay back in the same coin so clearly if we enter into a situation where uh, the the fundamental uh, of international politics geopolitics turn in a manner with uh, allowing for greater uh, conflicts uh, or, or allowing for greater uh, competitive rivalry between us and china it seems to be happening at the moment uh, this uh, is very bad news for a number of countries in the middle countries who do not want to see this structural uh, problem to uh, to be elevated to the status and the un has a very important role to play uh, and therefore it's uh, you know great powers uh, are important to make un work if they are not on the same page then the un will not be able to function un after all is uh, you know is is an organization of states so you have these states that have to come together and 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 work for larger global good but if the global good is defined in different ways in different world capitals especially in beijing and washington then we are in for real trouble and i think that is also you know that came out in the speeches of number of countries including for example uh, macron's speech emmanuel macron the french president also talked about that you cannot let uh, the the un uh, the us china rivalry become the dominant narrative of our times because that is going to actually take the world back uh, in 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 more ways than one so i think this this larger meta narrative at the moment of this cold war Uh, is very dangerous uh, and and but but there are no signs that uh, anything can happen to uh, you know decrease the tension between the two and nothing at the moment uh, seems to be in the reckoning as well because clearly america is passing through elections uh, and china has some very different agenda to yeah. at the moment yes yes of course and that's why probably the need for changes or reforms in the un so that it still remains relevant and when you speak of american elections there are just four weeks for the presidential elections and uh, president trump is already signaling that he may not accept the results if uh, he doesn't come out as the winner so uh, how do you see all this because he's saying that the democrats are rigging the 2020 elections and the truth is that there is a big uh, element of mailed in ballots this time so will that make a difference and uh, trump is already signaling that he will probably not accept the result if it is not uh, what he wants Yes, I think it's an attempt to, uh, in in some ways, um, uh, draw the lines that that perhaps Trump feels uh, is important to draw at this juncture. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, very interesting things happening. You know, the nomination of the Supreme Court Justice, uh, his uh, Trump's idea that look, there there might be problems. uh in terms of voting power you know um, processes and that is something that you might appeal to uh and and therefore it's it's very difficult to uh, to assess even at this point mm -hmm. uh you know what all these what kind of an impact all these factors may have on the on the elections and i think uh this this whole um, um 
Republican nominee for the Supreme Court uh, is perhaps very, very good, is going to be very important, uh, mm -hmm. more important than, than I think many recognize at this point, because it sends a signal to the larger conservative base uh, that Trump is on their side and he has done more than any other president if he, you know, to have a 6-3 majority in the Supreme Court uh, uh, in favor of the conservatives. Uh, three uh, judges uh, put on, on that bench by Trump himself in a, in a matter of four years. And that's quite a considerable record. And so if that can mobilize uh, conservatives in, in Trump's favor, and, and that's what Trump is looking for by having this nomination uh, fast and swiftly um, uh, done by the, the, the Senate, uh, I think the message is, is very clear. Uh, and of course, he then uh, also uh, points out that he may not accept uh, the results. He may not, he may challenge them. He does not see them as valid. Uh, he, there are issues there which he's raising again and again, uh, although, um, you know, uh, there is very little evidence to suggest what he's saying is correct. These elections are going to be different because it's held during the pandemic. There is going to be a mailed-in ballot in large quantities. But that, uh, that's his concern, that probably these could be hijacked. Uh, so is that a genuine concern? Will that make a difference? Well, he wants to make it, uh, mm -hmm. certainly Mr. Trump would want to make it a genuine concern. He would, mm -hmm. he would want to raise it to a level where even if it is not a genuine concern, it seems to be a genuine concern. Yeah. And I think it repeatedly over the last few weeks, if you have seen, he has been pointing this out. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you say, it is going to be you know, more uh, ballots which are going to be mailed in. And there is going to be the, the, one of the largest numbers we would, we would see. And so, uh, you know, if he challenges them, then certainly it, it, it allows him that possibility, that narrow window, if he loses in, in, in the voting, um, you know, in, in the counting, then he can raise this issue and, yes. and can delay the process of handing over of power for, as, you know, for a very long time. But I think it's, it's, it's a bit tricky. Uh, and and you, can, you have seen the reaction of, you would have seen the reaction of the Republicans, senior Republicans who, have, who, have, who came out and, uh, and almost said that, look, um, we, would, we would want a, you know, a, a proper handing over, quick, quick handing over of the power to be done as quickly as possible. So clearly, I think, you know, the American politics is in churn. Trump may have his own agenda. But if he drags on that agenda, then it might backfire on the Republicans. So I think there is that, that contestation also happening. Uh, and yet again, you know, you see things have been moving. That there are so many pieces of the puzzle. Uh, I, I don't think many expected that, uh, you know, uh, the, the Supreme Court nominee issue would come to the center stage so close to the elections. It did. It has come. Uh, he's going for votes. Uh, Senate will confirm, uh, most likely confirm. There are no procedural uh, ways in which it can be delayed. So there are issues, I think, uh, from all sides that keep on changing every day. Uh, and although uh, the voting, uh, you know, the opinion poll suggests that Mr. Trump might be, uh, you know, might not be in the, uh, the leader at the moment, but there are so many, you know, uh, unknown unknowns at the moment. Uh, some known unknowns, some unknown unknowns that, that I think are, uh, that do not allow us to make an assessment uh, of, uh, of who actually might be benefiting, um, you know, in these extraordinary elections that we have seen. Uh, and extraordinary it's also possible that, uh, you know, we have not also, we don't hear from Mr. Biden so much. That's another very, very extraordinary thing. You know, in, in another, I, I, in, in, you know, four years back, every day you'd have two sets of statements, uh, two sets of, um, uh, you know, policies being uh, discussed and debated. Today, uh, Mr. Trump has all the stage to himself. Mr. Biden is taking a backseat, perhaps wisely. Uh, he thinks that if he speaks less, perhaps it benefits him. But we don't know uh, unless, the, unless the votes are out. We, we won't know which factors actually played into, uh, into uh, you know, whose favor. So I think these are extraordinary elections, extraordinary times, and perhaps uh, therefore very fun to watch from outside. Absolutely. These are clearly very extraordinary elections. And like you said, we heard a lot from Mr. Trump, but we do not hear at all from Mr. Biden in just four weeks to go. And uh, so a lot of churning happening there. But that's it uh, that we have time for in this week of the Ideas Factory. We will uh, join you all next week. Thank you for watching.